I'm Leia. And I'm here to talk to you about table views. So let's do a little show of hands. Who here has ever been frustrated with a table view before? Yeah, that, that's what I thought. OK, so table views are great. They are the bread and butter of iOS development. And knowing how to properly set up a table view is almost like a rite of passage into becoming a real iOS developer. And that's because we need them in pretty much every app. They're really handy when you're trying to horizontally lay things out, especially if the content has to scroll. But they can also be pretty annoying to deal with. They're one of the oldest APIs available, and they kind of remind me of the word, like the apartment listings that say vintage. Which sounds cool, but it probably means that like, the roof leaks and the heating is broken, and you'll be sharing the apartment with a family of rats. So <laughs> I'm here today to talk to you about a few of the frustrations that I've had and how I've come to deal with them. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll end up with some tips to make your table views great again. So first up, we have reuse identifiers. So the reuse identifier is a unique string associated with a UI table view cell class. It lets your table view know what kind of cells it should be able to display when you register them and how to display them when you dequeue them. Now, when I look at this traditional approach, I find it slightly horrifying for two reasons. The first and most obvious one is that this app cell ID string is a string, literal, just hard-coded willy-nilly. And the second is that both when we register the cell and when we dequeue it, we're giving the table view repeated information about the cell. Why do we need to do that rather than just get all that info through in one go? For our first problem, we have a couple of options. We could add a static constant on our cell class. And that's better, because at least we don't have to type out the string twice. But it's just kind of hiding the problem. So instead, we could use the string describing method for our reuse ID constant and never have to use the string literal again. But we'd still have to do this on every cell subclass that we create. So can we do something to our UI table view cell base class so that all of its subclasses automatically have a reuse ID? Why, yes, we can. We can create a dummy protocol called reusable and extend UI table view cell with reusable. Then we can extend reusable for the instances where self is of type UI table view cell and add the reuse ID there as a static computed property. Now, any of our cell subclasses will have access to their unique identifier. Cool. Problem unsolved. On to the second one. So we're using the app cell class twice in our register and DQ methods. And that whole guard let unwrapping looks like a mess. And to improve that, we'll use a feature of the Swift language called generics. And first, a super quick primer in generics so that we're just all on the same page. Generic programming is a way for you to write code that completely abstracts the data type. So let's say you have to write a function that gets us the minimum of two inputs, and it has to work for integers and strings. We could do something like this, where int min takes in two integers and returns the one that's smaller. And string min does the same for strings. The function signatures of int min and string min are different, only in the data type that they accept and return. And the bodies are completely identical. With generics, we can reduce these two functions into one and remove the redundant code. We can create a new function called generic min and tell it we're going to use a generic type t that conforms to comparable in these brackets. The parameters it takes in are now also of type t, as is the return value. Now we can apply this function to any two pairs of comparable types, like integers and strings. But how do we apply this to our table view? Well, we can extend the base UI table view class with two new functions, one for registering the cell and one for dequeuing it. Our new register function now takes in a generic type cell 
constrained to the type of UI table view cell. And the parameter we pass is the type of the class. Then in the body, we simply call the table views register function and pass our cell type through use ID. And we can do the similar thing for dequeuing. We specify that we'll be using a generic cell and we'll return the generic type. And in the body, we'll call the original dequeuing function, use our cells, reuse ID, and do that whole guard let unwrapping dance here. And then fatal error out because you don't actually want to return an empty cell if you can't unwrap the one you want. And thus, we have transformed one of the more annoying bits of setting up our table views into simple one-liners. It might not look like much, but we've basically made the reuse identifier obsolete. And with that, we minimized human errors and frustrations with registering and dequeuing, and simplified our table view development across the whole app. Next, we'll address another type of repetition, and that is UI code duplication. Remember the old App Store? It used to be a very boring and plain app. Now, though, it's this compelling gallery of useful information and beautiful visuals and satisfying interactions. It's a UI UX joy, and I was really eager to reproduce it uh, for its design style, and I wanted to recreate this animation you see on the right. But as I was trying to do that, I ran into an annoying issue. I created this UI table view cell to display in these lists of apps. But then, I had to use the same exact view as a UI view in a bunch of other places. And as you can see, these views are pretty much the same. They have an app icon, a title, description, and a button. And I ended up with two almost identical classes that basically describe the same view. And that felt really redundant. So, my first thought was to make my app cell into this dummy wrapper around my app view. I gave it one property, the app view of type app view, and I pinned it to the edges, which was good, but not great, because I'd basically have to write this boilerplate wrapper code for every UI table view cell subclass. So guess what? Generics come to the rescue again. Instead of being specific about this app view property should be, we can create a cell that, use a that uses a generic type view constrained to UI view. Then we can simply replace the app view to be of type view and rename it to something less specific, like cell view. Now, any custom UI view that we create can easily be reused as a UI table view cell without having to write duplicate code. All right. All right. The final thing I've always found kind of tricky with table views is managing their data. And in terms of managing data, I tend to think of table views as dynamic and static. Dynamic ones are table views where the content is king, like Twitter or the New York Times app. They're completely dependent on the network connection because they need to be up to date to be useful. And managing data in this case usually means managing state. And I know what you're thinking. How is she going to use generics for this? Well, generics used with enums can actually be really helpful with that. In fact, they can be so helpful that there's been a lot of stuff written about this already. So today, I am not going to be talking about that. Instead, I'm going to be talking about their less sexy cousin, the static table view like the settings section, or the about section, or the user profile section. Basically, the table views that displayed a very prescribed set of cells in a very prescribed manner or layout, with little variable information. And enums can make a big difference here, too. But there's a bit of a problem with how we use these enums at rent or runway because even seemingly simple static table views like this one ended up looking like a mess. This cell for row method has over 150 lines, and I minimized the font as much as I could, and the screenshot still didn't fit the slide, which is ridiculous. We're using an enum, but the only thing it's doing is replacing this raw integer switching 
to a type safe and human readable way, which is a nice improvement, but in Swift, enums can do so much more. If we properly use enums to their full potential, we shouldn't have to write a Swift statement anywhere outside of the enum itself. So let's say we're building this simple view controller that displays the user's profile information. We can describe this table view with just two enums. User profile row for each of these rows, and user profile section for the two sections. User profile row can be a string type enum with assigned raw values that represent the cell's titles. So that instead of this ugly switch statement in our cell for row method, we can simply assign the raw value of the enum itself to be the title of the cell. The user profile section has two cases and is an integer backed enum, which we do so that we can use the index path property to get the correct section in our data source and delegate methods. And by conforming to case iterable available from Swift 4.2, we can easily get the number of sections. Since our user profile section has to be an int, we can't just assign the titles as raw values like we did for the rows. But while enums can't have stored properties, they can have computed properties. So we can add a computed property called title and return that as a title for the header of each section case. We'll add another computed property called rows for the array of rows to display for each section in the order we want to display them. Then, in cell for row, we can use this rows array to access the correct user profile row enum case. And the row count for the number of rows. So, by using just these two simple enums, we've managed to keep our data source implementation really clean and simple. Another really nice thing about enums is how easy it is to consolidate cases. As indicated by these placeholders, there are some things that are required and some things that are optional. By using the enum's ability to consolidate cases and have a default catch all, we can dictate what each row should display. Is optional lets us know whether the value is needed, and placeholder gives us the actual string to display. But we've got to be careful here, because while it's great to combine cases and have a default case handle the rest, this can actually be a real problem if you want to add a new optional case, like birthday, that should return true. Since the default case on is optional returns false, the placeholder for birthday would now be incorrect. So I recommend being very specific with your computer properties and spell out each case instead. So that way, even if you forget to handle a new property, the compiler will remind you. Okay, so now let me tell you about another cool use for this exhaustive nature of the enum. The whole point of the screen is to let the user update their profile. And to manage the data entering and changing before it hits the server, I created this intermediary user profile cache that would hold on to my variables. My cells were pretty simple. They had a UI label and a UI text field. And because I wanted my cells to be dumb and for display only, the view controller itself was going to be the delegate for the text fields. So to get the text out of a cell's text field and into my cache, I had to access it through the text field should return delegate method on the view controller. But here, I have no context about which cell the text field belongs to because there's no index path. And thus, there's no context about which enum I'm actually working with. And thus, I don't know what property for the cache I should update. So what can I do to figure that out? Well, my idea was to use tags. All UI elements have a tag integer property. And if I could uniquely tag my cell's text fields, I should know exactly which enum the text field belongs to. So I added a static property called all rows to my user profile section that flat maps the row for each section into one, and added another static function that gave me a unique tag identifier. 
Now to get the row for the specific tag, we can just return the row for that tag's index. And then we assign the tag to our cell's text field in cell for row. And then we know which enum it's associated with. Cool. But then I still have to use this ugly switch to decide which user property to actually update. And this really doesn't feel like it should be the responsibility of this method. So is there a better way? Could I somehow just nicely pass the row to the user cache and let it figure out what property to update? Yes. Yes, there is. You know how nice it is that dictionaries and arrays let you access their properties through an index? Yeah. Well, that's called the subscript. And it lets you query instances by typing an index in these square brackets. And we can easily define our own. We can make a new subscript for our cache using the user profile row enum as the index. Then we can move this ugly switch statement from text field should return to the user profile cache, where we use it to implement the setter and getter. And that lets us easily access and update all properties of the cache based on the row enum. By having the subscript, it's now also really easy to do something like validate the data the user has entered and alert them what to fix. We'll add a new function to our enum to check if the text entered was valid for the specific case. Then in our self for row method, we get the correct section, the correct row, and the value on the user cache for that row. And if it's valid, we make it black. And if we're not, we make it red. And with that, we have created a robust enum-driven view model for this entire table view. And self for row is only 10 lines long. So the code in our data source stayed pretty squeaky clean. And I'd call that a success. All right, time to wrap up. So this talk came about from my love-hate relationship with table views. And my goal was to give you a few concrete examples on how to improve them by being more swifty, not just for the sake of it, but because it's actually beneficial. We looked at how to use generics and protocols to eliminate the reuse ID. We also looked at how to create a generic UI table view cell to reduce duplicate UI code. And finally, we looked at how to manage the data of a static table view entirely through an enum. I really hope that you learned something new that you can apply to your projects and make your own table views great again. Thank you.